What's up, everybody? It's Whiskey Wednesday night here on the Mash and Drum. How is everybody doing on this beautiful Wednesday night? I don't even know how it is outside. It was hot as shit today and very, very humid. Um, I hate the damn hot weather, <laughs> especially humidity. But uh, I'm here. Nice staying cool here in the whiskey room. Welcome in, guys. Uh, we have a really, really cool guest tonight. Uh, great distillery, making some incredible, unique whiskeys. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, to, we're going to talk to Wit uh, Hageman from um, ASW Distilling, American Spirit Works. Uh, we're going to bring him in real soon, but I want to take a little bit of time here, say to say hi to everybody in the chat. Cameron Lochner was here nice and early. Tim Gorgeous. What's up, man? Roy R. Does Good Things. He's in the house. Sugar Kitty, of course. What's up, Big Vic? How you doing, man? Josh Randall's here. Mike Cullerton. Austin Feltz, Justin Jenkins. He's got some barbecue chicken and peerless burnt ends pairing. Oh, Jesus, man. Got my mouth, got my mouth of watering. Uh, Jeffrey Wax in the house. What's up, man? Uh, let's see. Eric Thompson's here. What's up? JG. Chris Abuzalencia. What's up, man? Richie Z, of course. The uh, the forever, just the, the staple in every chat. Love you, man. How you doing? Uh, Brett Marquette is here. What's up? Uh, pop them. Don't watch him. Of course. That is Troy. Everyone go subscribe to him. Uh, Whiskey Mountains is here. Nice to see you. Whiskey Mountains. That's Adriana. Uh, Adriana, we will remind me to bring up your, uh, your great live stream you got coming on, coming soon to raise money for Alzheimer's. And, um, I will be a part of that. Uh, Josh Randall, uh, Nick Foles is here. Uh, Lenny Scott. What's up, Donnie? Nice to see you, man. Uh, who else is here? Jimmy Bayman's here. John T. Timothy Juarez. Uh, Cheech Ardolino, of course. The Cheech man is here. Karen B. Ford is here. How are you, Karen? Whiskey Nose says he needs a wrench. You don't get a wrench because I saw your, your little Mets suck comment. So you don't get a wrench tonight. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> and the Mets do not suck. They're beating the shit out of Baltimore right now. <laughs> uh, Hendo is here. Uh, Ace. Of course, my bourbon journey. What's up, Scotty Tuhati? The Hawk is in the house. Whiskey with two jerks is in the house. What's up, man? And more of you and more of you coming in. Will Hendo Henderson. Uh, Alan P is here. Whoop, whoop, John Henderson. Um, so uh, we'll always hang out for some ASW. So real quick, before we bring our guest on tonight, just some, uh, some real quick fun things that are happening. Uh, I wanted to open up. Uh, a little bit for the four gate barrel pick that we did with uh, uh, the Mash and Journey Whiskey Club. So Scott and I were really fortunate enough to get a eight year MGP toasted rye uh, that was uh, released uh, over the weekend. And we are pretty much almost sold out, which is bananas. Uh, it's a pricey bottle, but the bottles have gone real fast. There's only a handful left. Uh, so if you guys want your hands on this one, um, there are a few bottles left if you want to if you want to grab one. Uh, it is 224 bucks. It is pricey. Uh, but if you uh, if you feel like you want to get something pretty unique that that toast, it's a it's an eight year MGP toasted rye that was finished in a toasted barrel from Kelvin Cooperage for about 34 days, 33 days, something like that. Uh, we've already had some people starting to get their bottles today and they're saying it's already freaking phenomenal. So, um, so you guys can, you know, kind of jump in and if you feel like grabbing one of those, please do, uh, whiskey nose rights go Yankees. Now he's definitely not getting a wrench. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'll, uh, there you go. Cheech Artelino just dropped the, just dropped the link, um, in the, in the chat. If anybody wants to grab one of those bottles, uh, the password is MNJ barrel. I think we only have about eight or nine bottles left. So if you guys want to want to grab one of those, have at it. Cheech, feel free to drop that link throughout the uh, the broadcast and um, see if we can get rid of them by the end of the night. Uh, also, next week, next week, right here in the Mass and Drum, very very special night. We are going to have Greg Schwartz, uh, director of the Water of Life. Now, The Water of Life is uh, an incredible, incredible documentary about uh, Brooklotti Distillery, uh, Jimmy Guin, and some of the incredible people on Isla uh, that work at Brooklotti Distillery, and just the lifeblood of Isla just being, you know, single malt, 
scotch and how it's kind of the lifeblood of the island and the 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 actual you guys have to watch the trailer i'll drop the link in the chat as well for that but it's an unbelievable trailer so with that happening next week you guys will actually have exclusive access to watch the film before it's actually released at the towards the end of the year so you can watch the film before it's released uh, you get to have a uh, well. We're gonna have some specials on some Brookla, some some single malt scotches from Brooklati that you'll be able to purchase with a discount. Uh, so you'll be able to watch the film and enjoy your Brooklati uh, after the live stream. So a uh, huge, huge um, guest coming on next week. I cannot. I am so excited for it. Uh, also included in that, as you see, will be uh, Erica Beindorf. Um, who's not only a great band, uh, brand ambassador for Brooklady, but she is she really really knows her shit. Um, some brand ambassadors, you come on and they just you know they know how to sell, but that's it. Erica, she'll sell the wh whiskey, but she's very very educated enough to talk about the distinct you know similarities, the differences, where the whiskey comes from, how they make it, where they make it, uh, and all that stuff. So it's going to be an incredible uh, time next week. Uh, so really looking forward to that. So uh, we'll talk that up as the week goes on. We want to try to get as many people buying tickets as possible. Uh, I'll be sharing that link with uh, Aquavite, Scotch 4 Dummies, Scotch Test Dummies. Get as many people involved as we can to make it a really, really fun night for everybody. So, um, yeah, Scotch Lifeblood. Uh, and I'm trying to think, am I missing something? I don't think so. I think that's everything. So with that... Guys, let's talk a little bit about ASW. ASW, American Spirit Works, is a one of the most awarded distilleries uh, in the United States since it opened. Uh, they are nestled in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, the ATL. Uh, tonight, we have the brewer and uh, assistant distiller uh, for, a, for ASW. Not only is he going to be talking about some of the, uh, the incredible whiskeys that they're making and they're crafting, but also... Uh, he's at the distillery, so we might get to see some of the inner workings uh, around the distillery as long as the internet allows it. <laughs> so without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Whit Hagman. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, Jason? How's it going? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. How you doing, bud? Doing good. Did I, did I say your last name right? Is it Hagman or Hageman? You nailed it. Hageman. Hageman. Oh, Hageman. Hageman. There you go. <laughs> so uh, so Whit, uh, you have the title of brewer and assistant distiller now when i read it i thought oh brewer this guy came from the uh the this guy came from the from the beer industry and he kind of fits right into kind of fits right into um distilling but you just told me that that's not exactly what you were brewing why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh what you were actually brewing before you made it to asw yeah uh, absolutely. So, uh, just just to clarify, the term brewer here at ASW refers to uh, making the whiskey mash. So, when we talk about brewing, we talk about brewing the mash itself, um, creating the uh, the the fermented wort or whatever you would like to call it, the wash. Uh, but that is the type of brew brewing that we are talking about here at ASW. Uh, before I worked at ASW, I actually worked in the coffee industry for eight years. So. Uh, I think really that's where I kind of got into um, just tasting different things and beverages in general. Uh, when I started at um, in the coffee industry, it was just a kind of part-time little thing right out of high school. And uh, before I knew it, me and the owner's son were partnering to make our own brand of coffee. Move on from there, start working at places uh, in Atlanta and uh, became like head barista here uh, and started doing some management things. Uh, from there, I was brought on uh, to East Pole Coffee, um, which is ranked right now the uh, best, best coffee roastery in Atlanta, or actually in Georgia. Um, and it was one of the uh, top roasters in the, in the United States. Uh, I worked there um, doing their education program doing their um, management for the tasting room or the uh, coffee shop, as some would say. But really in that time is when I started getting super obsessed with uh, flavor profile and 
uh, process and how this coffee tastes different from this because it was processed a certain way or getting into uh, making grind adjustments or brew time adjustments or even the type of water that we use, whether it's like a hard or a soft water and the actual minerals in the water and how that affects the coffee. Uh, it can get really nerdy. Other things that you can get really nerdy about are uh, is whiskey, obviously. So it was kind of a natural transition. Uh, ASW is actually right down the street from East Pole, and I met the owners through. Uh, they were just customers at East Pole. They invited me to come uh, into ASW for a bottling party or to help out on the bottling line, uh, come bottle for like an hour or two, and then get to take home a bottle of whiskey. I was like, sure, you know, my lunch breaks are uh, right around that time, so maybe I'll come and help out occasionally. I started helping out, uh, met the uh, master distiller, Justin Manglitz, and him and I really hit it off. Uh, he is a type of person that doesn't take in many new friends, but for some reason he decided to take me in as a new friend and I'm <laughs> su super grateful for that. Um, but I think one thing about, about Justin and about me is, uh, whenever we talked, I didn't pretend like I knew a lot about whiskey. I came to him just hungry and wanting to know as much as I possibly could, uh, you know, what it is, what is it about the mash bill? What is it about the fermentation? Like, how does the distillation process work? Like, how does the oak influence? I, I didn't know any of these things. I, I didn't know who Pappy was uh, when I, when I first what? came here. What? 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 I'm okay. <laughs> so it was, it was one of those things where he just really uh, started teaching me some things. And when he saw that I retained information, uh, he thought it'd be nice to bring me on as a whiskey maker um, and learn how to make whiskey mash and eventually potentially learn how to distill um, if the mashing went well. The uh, whole process with the mashing was one of those things that um, I, I had no brewing background as far as making beer goes, but it's a very similar process a lot now to uh, making beer. The fermentation is different. Uh, obviously, you're not using a hops, but everything else is, uh, you know, simple conversion from starches into sugars uh, and then converting those sugars into alcohol. So it is a very similar process. Yeah. Um, so he taught me that and I became the brewer, uh, replacing the last brewer, Drake, who I need to mention because he went to start his own brewery making beer. Uh, he is really a beer man more than a whiskey man, but Drake did a lot of amazing things here, and he actually taught me a lot. Um, I shadowed him for uh, many months in uh, 2019 when I was uh, first getting started here. That's amazing. How? What, what's kind of the similarities between – have you found any – uh, similarities or anything that mirrors your your experience in brewing coffee to brewing or you know making distillers beer? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So the whole process with coffee is all about extraction. Your goal is to uh, dissolve solids from the coffee and extract it into the liquid. Uh, whereas in brewing for beer and whiskey, your your more of your goal is conversion. Um, trying to get the conversion from the starches into sugars. Yeah. Extraction is really big with coffee, but there are interesting similarities uh, as far as in the type of water that you use. This is something that, you know, if you talk to anyone that uh, drinks Kentucky bourbon, they always have to talk about the water because of the minerals in the water supply. And that's something very, very similar that you'll find in coffee. If you brew coffee from water uh, native to Atlanta, you'll find that's a little bit harder, but if you brew coffee from somewhere else in the world, you might find that's a little bit different. Uh, if anytime I go to Florida, I always bring my own water from home because their water is so terrible quality. <laughs> that's for, very, uh, that's very making, true, yeah. Yeah, for making that's coffee. Why, that's, that's why the pizza in Florida sucks. <laughs> yeah. And no, the, yeah, that's true. And the, and the bagels too, but there are there are a few really good pizza and bagel places that actually fly the water in from New York to make uh, to make their stuff in Florida. I have For seen sure. that. Yeah, and I, I must I must say there are actually really good coffee shops uh, in in Florida that use a reverse osmosis system and then add minerals that they prefer back into their water. 
Um, and that's actually a similar process to uh, what we might do uh, whenever we're making a bourbon. We actually will add certain minerals into our water to match that, uh, that same type of mineral buildup that you'll find in Kentucky water uh, when we're making our bourbon, uh, trying to replicate some of those more traditional flavors okay. and the way it's made. But also uh, we do a lot of things unique, uh, like the pot, pot distillation. So. Well, that's awesome. I want to I wanna say hi to a couple of other new people that came into the chat. Julie Like, what's up? How are you doing, Julie? Hope you and Dan are doing great. Uh, Northwest Bourbon, Abby, who inks is here. What's, what's going on, Abby? My uh, The Bourbon Van is here as well. Great channel. Go check out The Bourbon Van. Black Bourbon Family is here as well. Jason and Brandy. Uh, you think I wasn't going to go through the night without singing your, your song? Raise your glass up casually. There you go. I just sang that for you. That's for Jason and Brandy, guys. Uh, Mike Meyer, what's up, man? Emily Chambers. Uh, let's see. At least there are good people in Florida. Yes, there are great people. My half my family freaking lives in Florida. So <laughs> I love Florida, but at the same time, it's hard to find good pizza and bagels there. <laughs> uh, see, this is what I'm talking about. Two more home runs for the Mets. It's ten to one. I'm a huge Mets fan. Uh, so here's something weird, uh, with, so I actually, I grew up in New York, I uh, grew up a Mets fan, uh, kind of like the giants and the jets, but I actually grew up an Atlanta Falcon fan. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Which is, uh, I don't, I don't know if it's awesome, but it, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was uh, an Atlanta Falcons cheerleader. Um, so shout out to my mom. Wow. Your mom was a cheerleader for the Atlanta Falcons. That's crazy. Yeah. She's pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so we the whole reason why I loved Atlanta was Deion Sanders. He was my favorite player, like ever. So I kind of latched onto him because there was really I have a very big like baseball family, but not everyone was really into football. So I kind of just latched on to Deion and the Falcons in the beginning. Wait, and then it wasn't, wasn't Michael Vick? He wasn't your favorite. <laughs> well, Michael Vick was my favorite for a while until you know what happened happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I see eight six. The Falcons are a humiliation to my city. <laughs> the I'm sure a lot of people. Uh, yes, and he was a Yankee, but I don't remember that at all. Was he knows? Uh, I'm just saying. Yeah, Neon Dion was my favorite. Um, <laughs> so so let's talk a little bit about the first uh, the first bottle I have here. This is the Fiddler. So would you say this is kind of your mm -hmm. standard your standard bourbon that you guys create? Yeah, so the goal with the Fiddler was to uh, create something uh, a little more approachable um, while also giving some unique character. So uh, the Fiddler is a blended bourbon of a sourced bourbon from MGP, that is high wheat, okay, and a uh, bourbon that we distill here. So one of the things uh, with being a, a young distillery is being able to produce enough product. So one of our solutions was that was finding a way to uh, create a bourbon that isn't just sourced and put in a bottle and labeled as our own, but actually do something with it. So the, the name Fiddler actually comes from uh, we took someone else's bourbon and we fiddled with it by adding our own bourbon that we make to it. Okay. Um, so this was a uh, product that it has the uh, traditional column still, high wheat, and a pot still, high malt. So I don't know any other bourbon uh, right now that's blending column and pot still uh, bourbon. Uh, it's so it's pretty unique, and it gives it a little more unique characteristics. Yeah, the well, I mean, there, I think uh, Woodford Reserve actually blends column and uh, and pot still. You are absolutely but, but, right. But they're not doing they're they're not obviously not doing high wheat and high malt. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think that's the so so what so which distillate that you guys create is in here? Is that the high malt? That is correct. Yeah, and it's okay. it is the, the same mash bill as our soloist. So uh, I see you have a bottle of that behind you. We can talk about that in a little bit. But yeah, the the high malt bourbon that we make. And when we say high malt, it's actually various malts. It's not just malted barley. We're using malted wheat, malted rye. Um, a chocolate malt, uh, a hit, hint of a smoked malt, malted barley, not peated, but a smoked malt. Uh, so we, we use various malts that are not uh, 
just limited limited to uh, malted barley. So with, with Justin, with his brewers background, so Justin, uh, we'll, we'll dive all into his story. He has quite quite an interesting story, but he, he comes from a brewing background. So when he thinks about uh, making beer and when he's talking about ingredients, he refers to anything malted, not just barley as malt. So he'll say wheat malt, or rye malt. So when we say high malt bourbon, uh, there is malted barley, but there's also malted wheat and malted rye. So it's yeah, really so, more four grain. so I think one thing this thing has going for it, uh, a few things actually, the pot still, which gives it a lot of viscosity, which I don't think column still. I think you get more of an elegant spirit, but the pot still gives you more of the texture, and you might get a little bit more of like the rawness of the spirit. But I think combining those two uh, actually really gives it a nice texture and feel. The all the different malts that are in this. I told you when I first tasted this that I literally tasted coffee. Yeah. And I think I tasted that chocolate malt coming through. So maybe it's the combination of the the chocolate and the smoke. It's giving me like this coffee note to it. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't know if you picked that up being from a, a coffee background, if if that was something that you noticed as well, but it's very it's very it's almost like a fresh coffee bean on the nose. Yeah, and, and coffee is a very common flavor that you're going to get uh, with a higher malt content just because uh, malt usually gives off uh, a little more of a, a uh, while, while rye or a wheat, the so wheat might kind of, uh, you know, highlight the barrel and a rye might, uh, you know, kind of in, bring in some spice. A malt kind of brings in its own unique characteristics and really focuses in on that flavor. So when we start talking about using various malts, we're really going to start highlighting different flavors that you're not going to taste with uh, a cereal grain. Um, so these are going to introduce new flavors, but yeah, some of those darker notes, coffee is definitely present in it. Um, uh, not specifically with uh, Fiddler, but with Soloist, uh, that is uh, the 100% um, pot stilled bourbon that we, that we make, 100% distilled here, 100% pot stilled. So this is the high malt bourbon itself. And that, that one, I certainly get a lot more of those notes. Uh, I think you you even mentioned uh, when when you were trying that that you got like heavy coffee notes. Yeah, I get some like a little bit of a, a malty like leathery thing, uh, a little bit of a, a dark fruit like a plum type of thing in that so, one as well. So what are the ages on? What's the ages of whiskeys in the uh, in the Fiddler Unison? Yeah, so the Fiddler Unison is a blend of uh, three to four year whiskey. So the uh, Soloist, the whiskey that we put in, is usually right around that three, three and a half uh, year mark. And then the uh, Source whiskey is usually about four and a half uh, years, four to four and a half years. Okay, well you're getting a lot of textures and flavors from a, from a younger whiskey. And I think a combination of, so something along the lines of kind of what Chattanooga is doing with their very vast amounts of high malt, um, but I feel like your your uh, profile is very different than the Chattanooga profile, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Um, let's see here. What uh, what wood do they use to smoke the malted barley? That's a good question. So with um, the uh, Fiddler Soloist, Justin, over the years, uh, this is kind of a testament to what he likes to do but he's actually adjusted the mash bill ever so slightly. He'll uh, make something with a cherry smoke malt and then he'll adjust it and do a traditional Roche malt. Uh, and then he's done a beechwood smoked malt. So he's tried different smoked malts. I think the current one in the batch that you have is uh, the, the, it might be the Roche malt and it could be the, uh, the beechwood or maybe it's sandalwood. Uh, but he's, he's, he's experimented with various smoke malts. Now, an interesting thing about it is the smoke malt is only going to make up, uh, I think it's, I have the mash. I, I, all, we, have, we actually have so many different uh, mashes and mash bills that I have to sometimes look at our recipes. So, <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the, uh, the soloist is 55% corn. Mm -hmm. It is 13.6% uh, wheat malt. It is 10.2% rye malt, 10.2% Munich malt, 6.8% smoked malt, and then 3.4% chocolate rye malt. So very interesting, very specific. Uh, but so and, and, and the Fiddler Soloist, now this is just all pot still, you said? 
Correct. Yeah, the soloist. So that then the name soloist comes from it not being a blended uh, bourbon, but it is our bourbon that we make 100% at ASW. So this is made here where the uh, unison is partially sourced from MGP and then partial, partially distilled by us. So. And my goodness, yeah, this thing is all just, I mean, so much chocolate, coffee. I get it. I do get that smoke, but I am getting like a smoked, uh, there's, there is like a smoked cherry note to it. Yeah. And you know what? The earlier batches were the ones that had uh, kind of the uh, experimental cherry wood. And I think that batch that I gave you was uh, batch three. And I'm pretty sure that was uh, some of the earlier casks. Um, in that batch yeah the coffee the coffee is still in here but this is more of like a um like a caramel macchiato yeah <laughs> i'm getting more caramel in here i'm getting more like a there's like a like an almond characteristic here this caramel. is this yeah this one's really interesting it's um Car caramel macchiato is a bad bad word in the coffee industry it's like saying <laughs> <poor filter. laughs> well so explain to me why is it a bad word uh Macchiato traditionally is a small espresso beverage with just a touch of milk and Starbucks wanted to sell more lattes. So they were like, let's take a latte and not stir it up and add caramel to it and call it caramel macchiato. So it's not, it's not even really a macchiato. It's, it's a latte with non stirred caramel. So they basically like bastardized the name macchiato. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty much all their drinks. Cappuccino is supposed to be different. Uh, yeah, flat white cortados. All these are supposed to be different, different drinks and different amounts of milk to espresso ratio. And they decided that hey, you know, not not to crap on on Starbucks. I mean, some people some people love it. It's, it's their juice, you know. But uh, for me, by just selling a bunch of lattes and calling them different things that aren't latte or that. Yeah, calling them things that aren't really lattes is it's, it's kind of weird. Come on, who doesn't love the strawberry funnel cake frappuccino? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean the blend of of and this now this is also non chill filtered, correct? Yeah, we we actually do not chill filter any of our whiskeys, even the lower proof ones. We we do not chill filter. So man, the uh, tex the texture of this is the most impressive. I feel like I could chew on this shit. Yeah, yeah. That like, the pot, the pot still, the uh, the non chill filter, everything like really comes into play. To like, I mean, even not some of our lower proof whiskeys, uh, our resurgence rise 80, 86 proof, and man, that thing, that thing is thick. <laughs> sure, Caro Macchiato is the Blantons of whiskey. <laughs> 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 oh, I love that. Uh, Patrick, Mer America runs on Duncan, buddy. There you go. <laughs> All about Duncan. Um, question, uh, Whit mentioned they blend source with their own a few years down the road. Once their own gets some good age and matures, they have plans on dropping the source. That's a good, uh, that's a good question. Sorry. What was the question? I, I kind of saw it first, but Whit mentioned they blend source with their own. Oh yeah, that is a good question. So soloist is kind of the answer to that. So soloist is a product that we put out at the same time as unison. Now unison will always mean, uh, coming to, coming together of the two different. So this will probably be a standalone product that we will, you know, potentially always have unless demand phases it out. Uh, but Soloist mm -hmm. is is our answer to that. Soloist is a bourbon that we make 100% uh, without any source at all. And in fact, uh, Unison and Heartwood, um, these are the, the only two uh, whiskeys that, that we have at all that have any sourced whiskey in it. Everything else we distill in house, which actually I have the entire lineup, uh, just in case you guys need it. So that those are the uh, all the whiskeys, <laughs> all the whiskeys that we've uh, uh, essentially ever made. I think there's a couple missing from it, but I, I went through and dug through the distillery to try to find all the whiskey. But everything we we make, um, except for uh, and and really that the, the the reasons why these two. Um, are not made in house is because there's really a, just still a big demand for that traditional column still flavor profile where the soloist is amazing, but it's really unique. And I think a lot of people would agree with this, that, you know, it doesn't uh, hit the same way that a column still bourbon it does uh, not. might hit. 
it, I would I would say for anybody that's watching, if you if you really, I mean, if you're a coffee lover, honestly, and I know we keep harping on these coffee notes, but like coffee, chocolate, texture, almost a, a bourbon that you can chew on and really feel the texture of it, uh, the viscosity of it. This and this, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this is a hundred proof. And what what is this retail for, Whit? Uh, this is a fifty dollar retail. So I think it's fifty dollar retail for a craft whiskey is not that common. Just saying. Yeah. So I think it's actually forty seven to be exact, but fifty dollars yeah. is right around fifty dollars. Yeah. Um. So what is the size of your pot still? And do you? Uh, so Rye right, Guy, they do not chill filter anything. So we we uh, we answered that. Uh, Hey, Donald Rance is here, the whiskey, the Irish whiskey yoder. Hello, how are you, Donald? <laughs> um, so real quick, here's a, here's a good question. Uh, where is the availability of the brand right now? Yeah, so right now we are uh, really just in the southeast as far as going into a liquor store and picking up a bottle. Um, there's not many stores in Tennessee. Uh, I don't know how we're doing in Alabama right now. I think a few has snuck in there. Florida, uh, there are definitely a few stores. Uh, we're in a little bit of the Carolinas. Georgia is really our main platform. Uh, we do have some available on seal box and on yes. wooden and on wooden cork. So if you're looking yeah. at buying some from a national level, uh, seal box, Blake is amazing. He comes in here uh, and mm -hmm. does uh, picks. Uh, we've had a lot of fun hanging out with Blake and doing some picks with him. Uh, his picks are phenomenal. I can't sing them up and praise them up enough. Yeah, he, so, he, uh, he picks so, good whiskey. Yeah, so myself and Scott from my bourbon journey, we have the Mash and Journey Whiskey Club that we started. We started doing a lot of picks. I think I think at some point an ASW pick is in order because this stuff is really good. I, yeah, we, we can make we, that happen. Yeah, we love a good pot still. And this is just, I mean, there's so much viscosity to it. Um, I was going to mention, guys, yeah, uh, ASW products are available on Sealbox. Um, the Fiddler Soloist, I'm sorry, the Fiddler Unison, if you kind of want to get a good glimpse of what that, that pot still that they utilize does, um, I think it's it's a really good starter. Uh, but this Fiddler Soloist, if you could find this anywhere, I mean, this is just all, it's so texture heavy. I'm really impressed with this one. I'm really liking this. Yeah, the Soloist is, uh, it, it, we've, we've only ever bottled it uh four times. So we've done four batches of, and they were all pretty small batches, small runs. Uh, it is trickier to find. I know there are some stores that carry it. Um, so, and they, they sell out pretty quick. We don't plan on, you know, raising the, the retail price though, because of that, we, we want to keep expanding it and bringing it to a, a more, uh, you know, at a, an approachable price on a bigger scale. I mean, a lot of it too, is we're, we're a really small young distillery. Yeah, um, we can get more into the timeline uh, in a little bit, but being a young distillery, as much product as we have, like if we pushed out on a national level right now, there's no way that we'd be able to. Oh yeah, you wouldn't be able to. Up. Yeah, and that make that makes sense. I mean, we've already seen uh, Scott and I did some picks with Woodenville, and they're already. I mean, Woodenville has you know they were talked about being crap for a while, but now they're at the point where they're churning out a lot of barrels. And even them, they're kind of slowing down their barrel pick program because they're just they if they keep throwing out these single barrels, they're not going to have enough inventory to make their regular whiskey. So when you yeah. talk about when you talk about a young distillery like yourself, even giving up any single barrels is probably a big deal. So I, I totally understand that part of it. Um, before we get into the Georgia Heartwood, which I really want to you know deep dive into that. Um, tell us about a little bit about the start of ASW. Now on your website, you, I read that the founders of mm -hmm. ASW, uh, they were kind of, they were influenced by, uh, um, Ireland, France, and England, and that type of distillation and all those components that went together to craft what you guys are crafting now. So can you just, if you could just touch on a little bit of those influences and, and, and how you feel it affects what you guys are crafting today? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So what, what you're referring to really is a lot of, uh, Justin, who is our master distiller, yeah. um, who, who was, uh, not one of the original founders, but he was brought on very early as a partner and helped a lot in the building of the distillery. Um, so the, uh, founders, uh, Jim, the CEO and Charlie, the chairman, they 
uh, met, in, met in college. They were college roommates, um, and they really bonded over their love for specifically rye whiskey. Uh, they thought it was interesting that both of them really enjoyed rye as their whiskey of choice. And we don't, we don't talk about their age, so we don't talk about what, what year that was, but uh, <laughs> the, it was in a time when rye whiskey was not the most popular type of whiskey. Um, so for them to both be enjoying rye, they really bonded over that. They decide they'd take um, kind of like their chances at uh, creating their own brand. In 2000, 2011, uh, they released uh, a kind of like a startup brand. They uh, looked for someone that could kind of make a, uh, a more of a neutral spirit, but somewhat of a whiskey flavor. Um, type of uh, beverage is called uh, American spirit whiskey. Um, so a, a lot of people confuse ASW because of, of, because of that American spirit whiskey was our first product, but American spirit works is uh, the, the name of our business. But I have a bottle of this. Uh, we have phased this out, but this was kind of the, uh, the starting uh, brand for us, uh, American spirit whiskey. And it is 95% uh, uh, neutral grain spirit, and then 5% uh, extremely young whiskey. So uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're talking like a, a barrel that was probably had a hole in the bottom just poured through type of thing. But anyway, the- I mean, the, that, look, that just looks like white dog, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is kind of like the answer to uh, a lot of people start with a, a vodka or a gin, or some people start with like a white dog. They, they started- uh, with something that they, they were trying to bridge vodka drinkers into whiskey drinkers. They're like, Hey, this is something that, you know, if you drink, uh, if you drink vodka, you could probably branch into whiskey. So they were trying to create whiskey drinkers. Uh, however, yeah, this does taste like a, uh, somewhere in between a white dog and a, uh, <laughs> vodka. But, uh, yeah, that started in 2011 and 2000 and 15, they started, uh, finding uh, people, uh, they say 70 of their closest friends uh, to raise money to build a distillery, which if I had 70 really close friends like that, that could give me all that money. That'd be really sweet. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they knew a lot of people have a lot of great friends and they started the distillery, uh, raised funds for it and actually overshot their mark for what they were aiming for and ended up giving some money back from their family. If like their aunts gave them some money like, Oh, here, here, Nana, you can have your, your, your money back. We appreciate it, but we got everything we need. Uh, kind of on the lines of, of that. That's not actually uh, what happened, but anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the distillery, uh, was being, uh, built and birthed, but they wanted to find someone that knew how to distill. So, you know, they could look um, to maybe like a third shift at a Brown Foreman or someone like that. But instead they found this guy named Justin who uh, most people bring a resume in on paper. He brought it in in liquid form. He brought in a bottle of whiskey and said, here, I made this, you know, that, <laughs> that, that was a, uh, his resume and it blew them away. It was a single malt whiskey mm -hmm. and uh, Justin having uh, 15 years of experience prior, allegedly, I must say uh, he, he was uh, already uh, had done so many experience ex experiments and tried so many things and really uh, figured out his style of distilling and making whiskey um, and he was ready to take it to uh, more of a grand scale and, and make it in a uh, way to get the products out there. So Justin, uh, he was brought on uh, and Chad was brought on as the fourth partner. So Ju Justin, uh, who is our master distiller, and then Chad, who is our marketing guy. So all of our branding, the, uh, the Fiddler, the Resurgens, all the branding Chad did. He did an amazing job with all that, I must say. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Um, yeah, it, that, that's the smartest job application ever. Um, <laughs> now that's a resume. Absolutely. Are you guys, we had a question. Are you guys available in Mississippi at all or no? So I don't think that we've got out. I'm not a sales sales guy. So I actually, I am not positive every single store that we are in, but I do think we are, uh, slowly working our way out there. 
I'm not sure. Uh, th there are some states like we had trouble getting into Alabama because of their uh, the, the way their law works yeah. um, is a little yeah. bit different. So uh, we need to look into Mississippi and see how we are there. But if Mississippi can get from seal box, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So tell me, tell me a little bit about the, uh, this Georgia Hartwood. So this is another version of the Fiddler. Yeah. Um, so this is a, this happens to be a single barrel cast rank. Is that, are all the Georgia Hartwood single barrels? That is correct. So, so Georgia Hartwood, um, is, is our only product that we do that is a hundred percent source product. Um, so we, uh, source a high wheat MGP. Um, but, the same way with the uh, Fiddler Unison, we didn't want to just put something in a bottle that we sourced and uh, put our name on it. We fiddled with it in the way that Justin, our head distiller, actually uh, chopped down a white oak tree from his land uh, in Jackson County, Georgia, and he harvested the inner heartwood uh, from the white oak, uh, dried it, hand charred it, and added staves of it to a barrel. Uh, these staves, anyone that's been on our tours has seen the staves. These are really big staves and they take up a lot of room in the barrel. So there's anywhere between 25 and 30 staves. And that really adds um, a lot of extra oak character. Um, this coming out at a, about a four and a half year old uh, column still bourbon, uh, having all that extra oak like really helps uh, sweeten it up. A lot of people say they get a lot of graham cracker. Um, I've definitely got some really big vanilla and caramel notes out of it. Um, yeah, this this tastes more like a traditional bourbon with some of the. I could definitely see the graham cracker note. I'm getting a ton of cinnamon on this. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of cool that you put a little spin on it using the Georgia hardwood like staves, kind of like a Maker's Mark deal where you added some staves to it to impart some flavor to kind of make it, like you said, like a Georgia hardwood. Um, real quick yeah. guys, before we, we sip that, uh, I want to say the, so whiskey mountains, Adriana in the chat is doing an Alzheimer's fundraiser on June 20th at 9 PM. Uh, so that is, you know, just about 11 days that's happening. So I know, uh, I'm planning on joining for a little bit on that stream just to help raise some money. Uh, and I, I do think I have a bottle or two that I'll be uh, throwing in the mix for, to, to raise some money. So, um, everybody definitely set your calendar, uh, mark that video as a reminder, uh, go to that link and make sure that you guys are a, a big part of that. And now uh, let's raise some money for Alzheimer's. I mean, the whiskey community comes together in amazing ways for good causes. So that is a, a great cause. So please, uh, please do and be a part of that. Um, also real quick, uh, if you guys haven't heard yet, our Mash and Journey Fourgate Private Select. Uh, this is our eight-year-old MGP toasted rye uh, that is pretty much sold out. I think we only have like eight, seven bottles, something like that left. So if you guys want to get one, uh, Cheech Artelino has the uh, the link. He could drop that in the chat. If you guys want to go there and grab one of the last few bottles that are left. Um, yeah, it's almost all gone. Uh, I grabbed another one today because I didn't want to, I want to have some more backups. So, uh, <laughs> if you guys, uh, are interested, definitely go and grab one. Uh, it's an absolutely fantastic rye. If you, if you like the Michter's toasted rye, then that one will blow your mind. So, um, uh, let's see here. Let's see what people are saying in the chat. Um, yeah, my mom passed of Alzheimer's, so please support this. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, my bourbon journey. Okay. Yeah, thanks for doing that, guys. So, all right, Georgia Hartwood. Um, so this is so when we talk about high wheat, are we looking at their ninety-five-five weeder that they have, or are we talking a different mash bill? Yeah. So, so this one is uh, it is forty-five percent wheat in the wheat in the mash bill. So we're we're talking. Yeah. Uh, fifty-one percent corn, forty-five percent wheat, three percent malted barley. Oh wow! Um, so yeah, hi high wheat. Um, and I, I might in mention so the 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 Georgia Hartwood is actually, um, I believe it's the 
first, if not only, whiskey uh, legally aged on Georgia oak. So that's the big part of the name, Georgia Hartwood, but being aged on Georgia oak. And just with some of the oak experiments itself, like uh, tasting the staves in there compared to like other types of oak has really uh, given a unique flavor profile that, um, it's you know, got a, It's got a really unique fruity characteristic on the very back end of it. Um, it, up front, it's all yeah. It's like all caramel. It's all vanilla. It's really rich. You get the you get those weeded bourbon notes. There's like a there's like a fruit like a fruity pebble cereal aspect to it. <laughs> yeah. But it, I mean, I mean, you talk about like a weeder and how people love smooth like weeders and uh, and not much of a burn. I mean, this has all that. This this really finishes easy, but it's also still got a little bit of texture there. It's got a little bit of heft. It's not too thin. Um, way, way, way different than coming off your fiddler soloist and your other stuff. It is. Yeah. This, yeah. This is more along the lines of a traditional like bourbon mash that you would expect. Um, like this is for like the people, like you want to get them in the door with this and then you want to try your own shit because your own stuff is so different and unique, but also delicious. But something like this, I think is really, um, it's more for the, for the traditional, bourbon drinker who doesn't really like to venture too far out of Kentucky or even Indiana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we have so many, uh, it's funny too, Justin and his, uh, his way of making, uh, whiskey, you know, he, one of the reasons he makes bourbons is because he has to, um, he, yeah. he, he's really more of a single malt guy and, uh, he has Irish, um, heritage. So he loves uh, Irish whiskey a lot too. Green spot is actually his oh, yeah. fav favorite whiskey of all time. So he, nice. he makes a lot of whiskey in a traditional way that, um, he's looking for certain flavors. So that was kind of his approach with the, the soloist was saying he wanted to make a bourbon that he wanted to drink. So he, so, he's, really, so, so he's really influenced by Irish whiskey and, and French brandy and, uh, and English beer and all of those different, uh, different types of because because when I was reading the information on it, it seemed as he he's taking a bunch of different uh, you know a bunch of different styles that are you know igniting him to you know be just you know innovate and create all these new flavor profiles, which I think is that's what craft distilling is to me. You know, I really feel like if you're innovating, you're using your own you know, grains. And, you know, I understand in the beginning, a lot of times you you do have to source just to get the ball rolling while you're creating your own stuff. But I mean, this, uh, the, the, the soloist being all your own stuff is very impressive for what it is. And, um, yeah, I think that we, sh we should definitely talk about some of the other, the other products. Yeah. I wish I would have sent you, sent you more, man. Uh, I, I definitely got to fix that and send you some more, some more stuff. We have so many <laughs> different products. <laughs> uh, so Eric Thompson, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, this is my kind of distillery fiddling with bourbon. Sounds great. I'm not a purist. So take a bourbon and fiddle with it. I respect ingenuity. Absolutely. Uh, it's yeah, awesome. Yeah. So it's a high wheat bourbon, not a high wheat whiskey. Exactly. Uh, John Morris comes in for the Alzheimer's fund, Jason. I lost my grandfather 25 years ago. Oh, sorry to hear that, John. Um, yeah, we're going to be, um, uh, let's just say we're going to be fixing to raise a lot of money there. So, um, I, I'll definitely have some, uh, some cool bottles to, to help raise some money, Adriana. Um, this is why I like craft whiskey willingness to take risk and try new processes. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting too, because you know, the more people I talk to about craft whiskey, you know, you still, you still run into the Kentucky purists that don't want to try anything outside of Kentucky, which I think is so short sighted. But at the same time, I do understand that people do get set in their ways and they want to kind of stick with what they know and what they like. So I get that part of it. But, you know, good whiskey and good bourbon is not exclusive to Kentucky anymore. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's go to this one, which I'm really excited about. So this is the duality. Uh, this is a double malt, double copper pot distilled whiskey, 57.5% ABV. Um, there's the label, another beautiful label, duality. If you guys want to check that one out. So would you, would you say that this is kind of a scotch lovers whiskey out of your, uh, out of your distillery? 
Yeah, so this was kind of like, a, we're all about bridges, you know, bridging the, the vodka people into a whiskey, but this one was more about like, how do we bridge American whiskey drinkers and Scotch whiskey drinkers? Like, how do we find that bridge in a way that's not gross? Because I've tried some peated bourbons and some stuff like that, that, you know, aren't, aren't really, uh, I, I don't feel like really make that. It's just like neither party really likes that that much. Uh, this one is one of the things that uh, it is not peated, um, but it is smoked. So we use a 50% malted barley that is okay. smoked with cherry wood. Um, so that makes up half the mash bill. The other mash bill is 50% malted rye. So, uh, you know, some people will drink it and they'll taste a rye whiskey. Other people will drink it and they'll taste the... Uh, that the malty quality quality and think, wow, that's like a, uh, almost like a single malt, but with a little bit of a different characteristic. So this whiskey, uh, you know, it's, uh, really twofold. Um, you know, there's the pun there with the name duality, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's a, uh, a, a whiskey that, you know, Justin is all about, uh, you know, pushing limits and wanting to do different things putting whiskey on your label as a, this is what I'm making is whiskey. It's not bourbon. It's not single malt. It's not rye. It's kind of a risky move, especially in the craft whiskey industry where people look at something called whiskey and they think, oh, that's probably not going to be that great. I, I, I don't know that many great just whiskeys with that terminology. I mean, yeah. there's great, there's great ones out there. I've had some good American whiskey, uh, but having something that is, uh, unique and flavorful, um, like this duality, um, and calling it whiskey, you know, uh, if it was 1% more rye, it would technically be a rye whiskey. If it was 1% more, uh, you know, barley, it'd be a malt whiskey, but Justin wanted to do something different and say, I'm going to do a 50, 50 mash bill and make this whiskey in a unique way. So, you definitely get the smoke on the nose here. There's a very distinct smoke note, but yeah, it's not it's not peat. It's not that peated medicinal smoke at all. This is more. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I'm getting the cherry, but I'm definitely getting that smoke aspect to it. There's also, I am getting still a little bit of like the, this distinctive little bit of a coffee bean note in this as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's really a lot of the multi character uh, mm -hmm. and the you know, even the barrels we use and even our climate having uh, a Ooh. little more humidity. So we could really jump into that too and talk about like the, the, the Georgia climate and how it's. Yeah, so so Georgia, Georgia is generally pretty hot for the most part. And it gets really hot in Georgia. Um, I know in the past few years, so my cousin, uh, my cousin Lisa actually lives in Buckhead. Yeah. And that's, um, that's actually right down the street from us. We're technically located in the Buckhead area. Yeah, so she, um, I actually told her I was coming on tonight with you guys, and she, she's like, oh, "There's a good distillery here. Where?" And I told her, "I'm like, hey, it's up. you go check it out." So, uh, yeah, so we'll she, should be, she should be walking in any any moment right now. <laughs> uh, hey, Lisa. But, yeah, what's the? So she, I mean, she has mentioned to me like in the past, like in the recent past, that we've had some some like weird climate going on. In, uh, in in Georgia as well. Well, while it's predominantly hot, you do get some like weird days where I know it, it like snowed there last year and you've gotten some really weird climate. So in a typical year, you know, is that why you, you can put out stuff that's a little bit earlier? I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not expecting you guys to put out stuff as quick as Texas, you know, Texas whiskey, they're putting out stuff at, you know, one and two years old in some cases, and yeah. they could push it that far. What's, What's the general climate for you guys and, and, um, and uh, how, that's work, how that's working in aging your own stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, so we actually, our aging facility is in a separate building uh, than our distillery. So we have a, uh, a second tasting room on the south side of Atlanta, and we have our aging facility there. So the rickhouse is actually in the back, and it is uh, not climate controlled. So we're able to get, um, you know, that unique Georgia uh, characteristic. However, it's not completely 
open uh, to that to the elements uh, it being a part of a building that is connected to a tasting room uh, but we do have uh, fairly hot summers and pretty yeah. cold winters actually um, so we've it, while Georgia is a uh, you know it's a southern state we do have uh, our winters we can get down to uh, about freezing uh, it's not usually much lower um, but we've, we've had somewhere between like the, you know, the 40 and the 25 degree range and some of our winters. So we don't see a ton of snow. Um, we get a lot of ice, uh, that just kind of falls on the ground and then disappears. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this literally smells like you left a piece of rye toast in the toaster a little too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I, I, I want to mention too. So our traditional uh, duality, so this is our proofed version. And then the version that you have is our cast strength version of duality. Okay. All right. Our cast strength is a, uh, is a single barrel uh, program that we have. So duality is a uh, whiskey that we have uh, opened for single barrel picks and uh seal box, I believe has done a pick. Um, we've had a lot of local stores doing a pick, but this is one, one pick that we're looking at you know, kind of get, getting out there and trying some things. The original um, is 88 proof. And uh, it was the first Georgia whiskey to ever win a double gold medal. Um, so in 2018 at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, it was the first whiskey to, in Georgia whiskey to take home a double gold medal, uh, which was super exciting and really, uh, you know, kind of surprising it being 88 proof. And then our first batch that we, uh, scent was actually only a year old uh, in quarter casks. So it was a wow. one year old whiskey uh, winning a double gold medal. So super exciting, uh, you know, get, getting that news and being able to get out like that. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, I read about all the awards you guys have won. I mean, you all your whole lineup. Uh, I do want to talk about your your regular your rye whiskey in a second. For um, sure. I do want to uh, say hi to uh, the Bourbon Wrench, Trev. Um, power's out. Here we go, just in case. Love you guys. <laughs> so, a pair. So, uh, Trev um, is uh, he's got a tornado warning by him. So, dude, grab the whiskey and get to the cellar, buddy. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, Abby Huing says, "Is there really such a thing as toasting your toast too long?" Abby, Abby, you like that burnt ass toast, don't you? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you burn if you burn toast when it when the when the integrity of the toast has gotten and it's shrunk down, and you you take a bite and it just falls apart. That's too long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gotta the toast has to have its structural integrity with a little bit of like black in the middle. That's how I like my toast. Uh, yeah, Trev, man. Everybody say some prayers for Trev. Hopefully he doesn't get hit with anything. Jesus, yeah. man. That's crazy. Um, here's a good question. If this hasn't been asked, are there any finished or rye, finished bourbons or ryes that you guys have worked on? Or maybe you have one next to you. I mean, we just don't know about it. Yeah, I do. I do have some finished products uh, sitting sitting next to me. Uh, we could we could move into the rye if you wanted to, or we can. Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about the rye and then get into the uh, some of your finished uh, products as well. Since you have, I can't believe how many bottles you have. This is nuts. Yeah, yeah, I I, I got them all out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the uh, Resurgence Rye. Okay. Um, so can you uh, can you hold that up to the camera real quick? Yes. Just one of them to see the label. Keep uh, go a little closer. Oh, there it is. Okay, Resurgence Rye. Oh, that's that's another cool label. Yeah, this one's a pretty pretty sweet label. Wow. A uh, a local tattoo artist that is a direct descendant from Basil Hayden actually drew this uh, drew this, which was pretty kind of pretty much kind of cool. Wait, a tattoo artist that's a direct descendant of Basil Hayden? That is correct. Yeah, he said he. That's uh, crazy. I think, might have been uh, related. I, I don't know if it was like his, his great grandfather or uh, great uncle or something, but I don't know. I need to brush up on that story. I might I might be a little bit off on that story, <laughs> but uh, get, Abby uh, Abby ask, Wing, Abby Wing, so she's a tattoo artist. Abby, we might have to get you to help out on some of our Mash and Journey uh, pick stickers. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Uh, got my four gate today. I'm waiting to pop the rye open. Oh, John Morris got his. Um, all right. So yeah. So tell us a little bit about the rye. Is this, 
is this all distilled by you guys? What's the story on this rye? Yeah, so so everything that uh, we have um, besides the 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 Unison and the Heartwood uh, Fiddler brands are it's made. All it's all it's ASW. All ASW, all pot stilled, all here, all by Justin, our master distiller. Um, so the Resurgence Rye was actually the first product the uh, first product that christened the stills. Uh, so Justin, um, with Jim and Charlie uh, having a big uh, rye background, uh, you know, loving rye whiskey, and Justin talking about wanting to experiment and make a unique rye whiskey, uh, this it just happened really quickly. Uh, so Resurgence is 100% malted rye in the mash bill. So all Justin, malted rye. Okay. all malted rye. So Justin likes to call it a single malt rye whiskey. Um, so that is, uh, it, for everyone that knows, single malt is uh, traditionally 100% malted barley from one uh, distillery. Uh, but this is 100% malted rye. So not to con not to confuse anyone. Uh, but so, uh, I just had a funny, funny comment. I hope the artist is better than Basil Hayden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I, see. So, I, I hope, I hope the rye is too. So, so one thing I want to ask you real quick. So when you, what's the process that when you do a multi rye, so, I mean, there's rye whiskeys where you get a traditional rye, you, you know, you, uh, you know, you, uh, you mill that down, you have your yep. grain, you have your rye grain and you, you know, you distill it, all that stuff. What, what, what's the process for malting a rye that makes it different than a regular rye? I just want to, I just yep. want to kind of go through that process for the viewers. Cause I really think, cause people talk about malted rye, malted wheat, uh, other malted grains. When you malt a rye, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, that's a great question. So malting in general uh, refers to germination, uh, okay. just taking the grain. So traditionally malted barley, uh, what makes it what it is, is uh, taking it, uh, putting a malting floor, adding moisture and allowing it to germinate to so sprout a seed. Um, so once the seed sprouts, uh, then they kiln it and stop that germination. And what this does is creates natural enzymes in the uh, malted barley itself. So similar uh, enzymatic activity actually happens in other grains when you malt them. So malted right, rye. So, so, that, so that's what was my question because I know malted barley, you generally in bourbon, you use the – you're not really getting much flavor from the barley. You're really using it for the enzymes and, and uh, for, the, uh, for the, you know, the, the, the structure of it, the actual like chemical structure of it to help convert starches to sugars and to do all that. Now with – I, I just like when I always hear malted rye, I'm like, man, can you malt rye in the same way? Is, is it does it do the same thing? Um, so, uh, yeah, I just want you to kind of break that down. So when you malt a rye, exactly how does that work? Uh, I'm going to get my laptop charger so I don't lose you. OK, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so malting a rye. Uh, so we, we actually we don't do any malting here at the uh, at the distillery. We get it malted um, and sent to us. But um, when, when doing uh, rye malt, I'm pretty sure it's a very similar process uh, as you would like do like malted barley and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, man, I really am bad at multitasking. I can't talk and walk and. You're doing that. great. You're doing great, man. <laughs> hey, why don't you uh, why don't you show us those big beautiful copper uh, stills while you're walking around? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Internet connection holds up good. I will go ahead and show you guys the uh, the back room before I get get y'all plugged in. So yep. uh, right here we have our fermenters. So there are 500 gallon fermenters. There's eight of them. Um, I'll actually we have some uh, single malt currently fermenting. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we, we got a nice firm cap on it. So we do an open top fermentation. Uh, fast fermentation that okay. uh, helps us get get some good flavor. We have the mash tun right here behind me. This is why I do a lot of my work on. Um, that's yeah. a, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. Your beautiful brews, huh? Yeah. So it's a it's a thousand gallon mash tun, and uh, it does the job. Get the conversion that we need. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I have enough battery 
I have nine percent, so I'm good All to right. sh show you the stills. So yeah, here's our a little more time. There they are. Look at those beautiful pot stills. Jesus. Yeah. So we have uh, two stills. So you'll see the still um, over there on your left is the wash still. So it is a uh, 300 gallon wash still. Or, sorry, 500 gallon wash still. Um, and then we have a 300 gallon spirit still over here on your right. So uh, they are traditional pot stills. They're made by Vendome and uh, Louisville. They do a fantastic job. But uh, our did, actual- did Justin, did Justin name his pot stills? Usually you name them, did he name them? That, that is a uh, Justin question. He, he does not, he likes to go against the grain. So if everyone does something, he's not the type of guy that's like, I'm just gonna do it because everyone else does it. So he might, <laughs> he, he might have nicknames, but he, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what they're called. So <laughs> okay, uh, we, we call that one the wash still and that one the spirit still. That's a, that's a, those are big, beautiful pot stills. That's awesome. Yeah, they, they, they're fantastic. Uh, and I actually, I want to mention our process that uh, Justin does is a, uh, a process that he invented. He actually had an agitator um, added on to the back of the wash still so that we can do a grain in distillation, uh, which is what you're going to find commonly in like a continuous column run, but in traditional uh, scotch and uh, Irish whiskey making and traditional pot stills, you would never see anyone actually put the grain uh, in the actual pot still. So uh, this is a, a unique process that Justin kind of uh, wanted to blend like traditional um, scotch and Irish whiskey making and uh, traditional American whiskey making and trying to do different things. So doing a grain in distillation uh, was a really cool uh, type of thing that actually is one of the uh, secrets and uh, a lot of the thickness and a lot of the flavors that we're going to get out of our distillate. All right. So that's the secret to why your whiskey is so damn chewy. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one of the many secrets. Oh no, we lost him. He's got to he's got to plug in. <laughs> he'll he'll be back, guys. So while we're, while we're waiting for him to to come back, um, holy crap! I'm telling you guys, if you guys haven't tried this stuff from ASW, it's really good. Woo! The um, I I love this duality. It's really different. It's really unique. Uh, yeah, he did warn us. He'll he'll come back, guys. He's just got to plug in his laptop. <laughs> You can do this to me. <laughs> I see six once more. He'll come back once he uh, once he plugs in. Uh, more of these streams, so great. Oh, we lost him. Okay, let me uh, get rid of this here real quick. Uh, we'll wait for him to to jump back in. Okay. So, uh, so real quick, just to oh wait, he's back. There he is. Yeah, I uh, I ran to the nearest plug, so this is not the normal spot, but I. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> we're, we're, we're lost yet 8%, but uh, hey, I'm back. Yeah, that's then, awesome, man. Yeah, different part of the distillery. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I will say seeing those copper pot stills, my Lord, that's, that's so, uh, yeah, I, um, Whiskey Mountains wrote that Jason's in love with the pot stills. Yeah, I think I am. I might be in love. Um, love these technical info driven streams. Yeah, definitely, Dave. I mean, this is what I love to do. I love to help educate. <clears throat> especially through, um, you know, having not only education, but also, you know, learning about different brands that are out there because I think what ASW is doing is really unique and, and really good. Um, I had this question for you. Ask him to talk about optic promise. What's that? Yeah. So uh, that is one of our single malts. Uh, so we have done uh, seven or eight uh, different single malts. So Justin, our, our approach and Justin's approach to uh, making whiskey is he, he doesn't want to just make a few different mash bills that are always there and maybe use different re recipes with different yeast strains. He wants to create new and different whiskey uh, constantly. So uh, we, we almost look at ourselves as more of like a craft brewery that has all these different types of beers and stuff, but uh, when it comes to whiskey. So uh, one of the ways that we express that and one of the ways that Justin really gets to show off is through a single malt. Uh, single malt is one of Justin's number one favorite uh, drinks of choice. So you'll hear him talking a lot about uh, traditional scotches that he loves. And actually, I should have mentioned this when we were over at the stills. I was just 
uh, trying to race race against the clock. Uh, there was so much more, man, that I, I want to say about the stills, and we can talk about it. But I want to say when I was over there. Uh, but the still shapes themselves, the uh, wash stills actually shaped uh, very similarly to mimic the uh, Glenn Farkless, their uh, still shapes. And the uh, spirit still is uh, shaped after the Glenn Morangi uh, super, super tall, uh, spirit stills in Scotland. So, uh, using different and, uh, unique processes and trying to get flavors that he likes to find in, uh, in a whiskey yeah. and like he likes to find a single malt, but optic promise, we can talk about that. Um, so optic promise is a, uh, single malt rye or sorry, single malt whiskey that uses two different, uh, malted barley. So it uses the traditional optic which was a very, very popular uh, barley varietal in Scotland and is now referred to as Spring and Golden Promise. So Golden Promise is uh, a very popular uh, malt to use in Scotland as well. So he took yep. these two extremely popular uh, malt varieties, uh, malted barley varieties, and decided to make a, a whiskey that uh, used both of them. So Optic Promise was this year's, past year's uh, release for our what we call Americanic series, which is supposed to be American and Gaelic, um, which I don't know if that's actually American and Gaelic. Some people have told us we're wrong, but that's, that's what we say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark says, cheers, Jason, and cheers to curing Alzheimer's. Has malted barley always been used in bourbon making? Um, not in the beginning. Um, if you go back in history, uh, bourbon was primarily, I mean, bourbon wasn't really bourbon. I mean, bourbon was being made, but remember, it wasn't a, it wasn't a product of the United States until the 1960s or recognized as a product of the United States until the 1960s when uh, the lawmakers kind of told you distinctly how to make bourbon and use barley. Before that, you know, when you're, when you're going back to the 17 and 1800s, it's, it was mostly rye whiskey was being made because of the abundance of rye grain. Uh, once the settlers reached Kentucky, you a lot of corn was there so there was a lot of corn whiskey being made um i think generally just as recipes evolved as bourbon making or as whiskey making evolved and they found out just like everything else through you know just probably through experimentation you know what barley can bring to the table as far as helping to get sweetness and germination and a lot of the stuff that wit was uh, talking about um i think eventually barley i i can't say or know when barley was exactly introduced into the bourbon recipe as a standard, uh, maybe it was the '60s. Maybe that's when they, you know, in 1954, when they told you, you know, that's exactly how bourbon needed to be made. Uh, that's really like kind of the traditional mash bill story. Um, you know, 1964, when Congress said bourbon is bourbon, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an American standard uh, spirit. Uh, and then the rules were laid down. This is when, this is how you have to be You have to be at least 51% corn, rye, barley, then you can use whatever else you want. But I think barley was kind of introduced at some point to, again, as Whit mentioned, to introduce some of those enzymes and some of those uh, conversions from starch to sugars. You know, you're not going to get a lot of flavor from, from the barley, especially in traditional mash bills. But as we see here, uh, with craft whiskeys using more and more, barley in their mash bills it is making a difference in the way it tastes there's there's more of a of a like a toast profile and a coffee note and uh we've seen we've talked about chattanooga before and some of the caramel malted barleys and the honey malted barleys that they're using all to create their own flavor profiles and we're seeing this here too with asw so yeah I hope that was I hope that wasn't too long winded of an answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> no, that was a great. So I do have a bottle, uh, a par partial. Oh, bottle. there's the optic promise. Okay, optic promise. So yeah, this one actually just won a double gold uh, for 2021 in uh, the world uh, world San Francisco San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Um, so we this year was a really great great year for uh, us. Uh, I think we entered out of all the whiskeys that we entered in the. Uh, craft whiskey category, we were able to take away uh, th three double gold medals. And I think there were only eight double golds awarded in the craft whiskey category this year. So for us to be able to win three out of the eight was uh, was very, very 
uh, exciting for us and something that we're all really proud of, proud of Justin uh, for making such kick-ass whiskey. So, yeah. So why don't you tell us about some of this finished stuff you got uh, going on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the, uh, the resurgence rye, we actually have a sherry finish of that. Um, we have some experimental uh, single malt with uh, some unique finishes. We have a lot of the things that we do that are unique finishes are really just single barrels. This is kind of like our way of kind of testing the waters instead of like full commitment. We do have a single malt coming out uh, next year that is going to, or it might even be later this year. I think it's almost uh, finished. It's been in a port cask for some time now. So it started in uh, New Oak and then moved into port cask, which finishing casks are, you know, uh, amazing. And I think one thing that is helping uh, people kind of branch into uh, like used cask whiskey um, like that you'll find in Scotland and Ireland. And really that's a big, uh, a big problem for people to get into uh, maybe Scotch or Irish whiskey is maybe they don't like the flavors attributed with a used cask versus a new cask. So a lot of people yeah. uh, really want that, that new charred oak and all, almost all of our whiskey um, is, at least started in new charred oak. We haven't done uh, really anything in used oak. Uh, maybe just a few single barrels here and there, but all of our standard products are released in new oak, including our single malt. So our single malts have actually been a big uh, branch for for uh, bourbon lovers and rye whiskey lovers to say, oh, wow, this is a single malt, but it tastes oaky and I'm getting some caramelness, but I'm also getting all these unique flavors from the malted barley that you guys are using. And, and, um, I, and I think, so if you, when you talk about scotch, you know, being single malt, uh, you know, using hundred percent malted barley, you know, you talk about the flavors you get cause they're mostly using used casks, you know, whether it be sherry, whether it be port, whether it be ex bourbon, um, uh, Oloroso PX, all those, all those different maturations they do, uh, you know, overseas in Scotland. I think that you're, I, I really do think that the high malt bar uh, bourbons or high malt whiskeys in general, American whiskeys do really well with a good finish because I think it balances the barley flavor with the, uh, and, and I mean, if you guys haven't had the Chattanooga port finish yet, so you get that high malt, like, like that kind of medium to burnt toast characteristic with the port finish, which gives it like this toast and jammy note it just it just goes so well together and i think that's really indicative of using the barley remember remember uh, a couple weeks ago we had greg metz from um uh well he's now with old elk we had greg metz from old elk but he's a legendary master distiller from mgp he was talking about how he he put more barley in his mash bill in his proprietary mash bill for old elk to create uh, a little bit more texture and some more smoother flavors uh in his whiskeys so I think we see a lot of that uh, here too. So I just wanted to kind of go back to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And with our bourbon mash bill that we have for Silos right now, we do have future bourbon mash bills that won't, won't be ready uh, for a little bit, but uh, they all definitely hit on the, the high malt. Um, yeah. And it, that's a big thing that Justin does just because he really loves uh, the flavors attributed with malted barley. He feels like, you know, we're, we're corn, um, I actually, I need to mention this story cause I think it's pretty, pretty funny. Most corn that's used in, uh, like most mainstream, uh, or, you know, traditional bourbon making is, uh, the, the flavors attributed with it aren't very powerful flavors. Um, you're going to get a lot more power out of the Oak, but when we first started making bourbon, uh, they wanted to, the owners were really adamant about, we need to use a, a local heirloom variety corn. And we met up with this farmer and started getting this corn and Justin did his first runs of bourbon uh, with it. And they were tasting the white dog and they're like, Oh man, this is so corny. <laughs> uh, and we, we, we put in some barrels. It's still sitting in those barrels, but we have nicknamed it pornography. So pornography. I like that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's a good question. How often since, since Justin is doing so much experimentation with mash bills and barley's, uh, how often do they try something they don't dig and then they don't bottle it? That is a great question. So we actually uh, have done a whiskey that uh, we donated for a you know charity fundraiser, and it was one of those whiskeys that 
you know, they decided like, hey, let's run with it because people do like it, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. We have this whiskey called The Crossing, uh, which I do believe we have a bottle of that sitting over there. I actually like The Crossing. You know, people yeah. give Justin shit about it all the time because <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people don't like it. Justin likes it. I like it. You know, it's 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 just different. So The Crossing is a, uh, he calls it a quadruple malt whiskey using uh, 25% malted barley, 25% malted rye, 25% malted uh, wheat, and 25% malted oats. So it is malted a oats. malted oats. So he, he you, guys, he's, you guys are, you guys are just, I feel like if I walk in there, I'm going to get malted. <laughs> <laughs> you guys yeah. are, you guys are malting everything. <laughs> yeah, we have a, uh, yeah, we have some, uh, some experimental stuff coming out in the future with uh, some, malted corn too so be malted on the lookout corn? oh my yeah. god yeah yeah we have, we have some un unique stuff so i think it's one of those things that uh while a lot of people that are making whiskey are looking at uh you know uh when they're getting getting and sourcing their grains uh you know they're looking at uh traditional places that they normally get it from justin's looking at the brewing catalogs he's looking at the same thing that the brewers are looking at for making beer and deciding what types of malts and what types of grains he wants to use and uh, you know, crafting a mash bill is one of those things that uh, he he can almost taste it because of how much he has experimented in his lifetime with not only making beer, but, you know, allegedly making other like craft spirits in his own time. Just getting this type of uh, understanding of what flavors you're going to get from grains. He can kind of craft it in his head before before the the grains even, you know, touch the mash ton. So. It's pretty exciting with uh, uh so, just so some stuff. You, so what can you tell us that you have that you guys have coming out soon um, that you can talk about that will not only be available at the distillery, but possibly be available on Sealbox? What do you guys got coming up? Yeah, so our uh, rye whiskey that we have, uh, we usually do a, a, a single barrel of that every uh every year just one barrel now our rye whiskey is one of our most popular products so we do a single barrel cast strength um it is a hundred percent uh malted rye and that flavor i wish i would have sent you a bottle man now the more and more i talk about it i was just thinking i have to fit three three bottles in this box what do i give them <laughs> you know i was like all right these three but uh yeah and and now that I know also I've watched your channel and seen that you're, you're really into scotch and single malt too. So I need to get you some of those products or single malt products. Yeah. I, uh, I, think, I think the next time uh, when you guys do a, a new release or you're doing something, you know, soon uh, we got to get you and Justin back on if we can and really take a deep dive into what he's crafting because we've had Alan Bishop on from spirits of French lick. He's, you know, he's kind of a distilling maverick and I feel like Justin falls right in line with that. Yeah, just Justin is one of the types of guys like I could tell you stories about him all day, but you really got to really need to talk to him yourself and yeah. see what he's yeah. all about. Yeah, yeah for we'll sure. Get him back on. But yeah, I mean, we have a lot of cool things coming out. The space hide. Uh, so I'm 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 saying it space hide. Oh, space say? space hide, kind of like space hide. Yeah. So so, so, so I, would, I would imagine that's a is that a single malt? It's a single malt that uses um, some uh, space side uh, style malt and a hint of a little bit of a smoke malt, but it really, uh, and that's one of the ones that we're doing finishes. We're doing a, a special release sherry finish, which I should say right now is to uh, honor one of our friends and uh, past coworkers, uh, Brett Ferenz, who uh, unfortunately passed away from cancer earlier this year. So he was known as the Scotch trooper in the whiskey industry Yes. Um, yeah. So he, he, yep. yeah, he, he actually worked with us to open up uh, our, the tasting room in our Rick house and uh, calling a uh, a whiskey space hide was one of one of his ideas. And he wow. helped kind of craft that. So Justin came up with the mash bill and Brett kind of helps brand it alongside Chad. But we're going to do a uh, we did one barrel. That's a sherry cask finish. That's going to um, be be in honor of Brett. And then we have more uh that are going to be our standard release is going to be a port finish but it's supposed to hit kind of those uh traditional uh fortified or fortified wine uh casks finishes that you'll find in traditional space side scotch yeah uh you know scotch trooper uh was 
you know, he was he was actually a good friend of the entire community. Um, you know, we we knew him and you know, a couple of the channels raised some money for him as well. So uh I know Scotch Test Dummies were close with him. So, you know, the fact that he was affiliated with ASW, what you guys had going on, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, he he worked in our tasting room and when actually when I first started, I uh uh, before I was uh, making whiskey alongside Justin, I was just helping out a little bit in the tasting room here and there. Yeah. And I was still very new to whiskey. Uh, this was uh, about, I don't know, I don't have a good timeline in my head, but it was a few few years ago. And Brett was uh, Brett himself was really helping me uh, develop a whiskey uh, profile and a flavor profile and help me understand like different flavors. But he he really. Yeah. There's a lot of scotch shitting, uh, scotch sitting on my shelf. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scott Trooper had a great Star Wars whiskey Instagram. Seemed like a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we definitely miss him. Um, he was a good friend to not only just whiskey too, but he was a great a great presence within the whiskey community and what he was doing. So um, when that releases, I would love to have you guys on and talk about it and uh, with Justin and hopefully we can. Um, uh, you know, get all those bottles sold, you know, as a, as a tribute to him. Cause, um, yeah, yeah, he was, he was an amazing person and I know he left, you know, he left behind a really beautiful family. So. Yeah. Yeah. Much, much love to, to Brett's family. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, let's see here. So, uh, I think, uh, I, I gotta say, I think my favorites of the night. I don't know what, what which one I love more, the the duality or the soloist. Uh, both of these are incredible. If if you guys are looking to try something from ASW, um, I would highly recommend trying the Fiddler because this is all ASW. Uh, all them, all their own distillate, just delicious. It's, I mean, you can literally chew on this stuff. Um, and the duality for the double malt, that cherry wood, that smoked malt, absolutely delicious stuff. You really do get the smoke. You get a lot of fruity characteristics as well. Really impressed what you guys are doing. Um, if anyone's in Atlanta that's watching and has not been there yet, you better get your ass there like as soon as possible and try this stuff. Hell um, yeah. I I'm going to say it's not your traditional type of Kentucky bourbon profile. This is, this is different, but, uh, I'll say this. If you like coffee and chocolate, you will love this shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, yeah, again, it, I haven't tried the rise and some of the other stuff they have brewing. Yeah, but... it, it's, it's really different. The rise, uh, the single malts. And honestly, I'd be in really big trouble if I uh, didn't talk about Maris Otter. Um, oh, so, Maris Otter. Oh, so what's that one? So this one is a single malt. So like I said, Ju Justin's crafted about, I think, seven uh, – uh, seven different single malts, I think. Uh, but Maris Otter um, was a single malt that uh, uses 100% uh, Maris Otter varietal of malted barley. Okay. And it was uh, released in 2019. And 2020, we submitted it to San Francisco and it took home the best in class award in 2020 for craft whiskey. So, Ooh. uh yeah, this was a it was a really big deal for us winning best craft whiskey in the world, um, and you know just having something that we could, uh, you know, really be proud of. Like, I mean, there's if there's not already enough for Justin to be proud of, but taking home best craft whiskey in the world 2020 was a real real big deal um, at San Francisco. But uh, we, what, we uh, uh, what year was that? Uh, so 2020, uh, 2020 oh, is when last year. 20, wow. That's incredible. So it was one of those things that, uh, I think it won the award in March and that's also when the word world fell apart. So it was yeah. kind of one of those things that people yeah. were really concerned about dying and, you know, we have a few, uh, people down in it, uh, you know, in Georgia, we have Will Henderson. Um, I think I saw some other guys, uh, from Atlanta here that were in the chat that I think might, might be going to visit you again. Yeah. Um, I know I uh, Slade, Slade Gulledge. He's a great viewer. He's down in Atlanta as well. And of course, uh, I see, what is it? I see eight, six. I always forget. Oh yeah. I see eight, six. Uh, do you guys, he actually had a good question. You guys do, uh, you guys doing tours over there? 
We are. Yeah, we just started. So at first, uh, during COVID, we were not doing uh, tours uh, this, the normal way. We were doing more of like a hallway tour. We have just opened up tours. We actually have a new tour guide uh, na named David. Uh, he actually came from Angels Envy and he does tours here now. He is a fantastic tour guide. Um, so yeah, we are doing tours and tastings on uh, Fridays and Saturdays currently. Um, okay. Those are the only days at the main distillery. Uh, you can go to the Battery, which is our second distillery that we just opened up that has a column still that is uh, ran by Jerry McCall. He makes vodka and gin. So we kind of yeah. did things backwards. We started with whiskey and now we're making vodka and gin. Uh, <laughs> that, that is a little backwards for a crap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bu bu Bustletown vodka. Uh, this is our, our vodka that Jerry makes. He does a fantastic job of that. And then Winterville gin will be released, uh, I believe next month. Uh, and that is a fantastic gin that uh, uses marigold um, influence or marigold in the actual botanicals. So it's super delicious. Uh, I want to say good night to uh, Julie. Like, uh, you know, try not be easy on Dan. Don't wake him up. You know, try to, if you can, you know, carry him to bed, be gentle with Dan. <laughs> uh, I also want to say, let's see here. Uh, pop note, watch him has a, he's down in new Orleans. Uh, do you guys do on-site barrel picks? This is what I'm interested in. Cause I really do want to, I think we have an opportunity to do a really cool, if you guys have barrels available, we uh, do. Yeah. yeah. So we, we are doing on site barrel picks with uh, with mostly it's stores in Georgia right now. We need to figure a way of getting out. Our marketing guy, Chad's actually working on doing uh, picks outside of our uh, main sales reps territory, which is uh, in the southeast. So if you need sales in the southeast and you had to talk to Josh, Nick and Luke, they are our sales. Well, could you guys. do uh, do you guys do picks through Sealbox? We do. Well, that's the other thing. So, yeah. Uh, Chad has been doing some picks with uh, some people over in Texas, um, okay. some yeah. heartwood picks and stuff like that. So yeah, we, we absolutely are doing barrel picks. Uh, Duality is our main product for barrel picks currently, but we oh, also Oh doing... yes, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Georgia Heartwood's another one that we do barrel picks for. So okay. uh, right, right now we are uh, still, so our last year's release of uh, Georgia Heartwood uh, was fantastic. Um, and we are waiting for our next batch to really get that, uh, that big oaky flavor profile that we wanted to. So it might be a minute on, on the Georgia Heartwood, okay. um, maybe another six months or so, but the, uh, the duality is, is ripe for the picking. So it's ready. Old man, Joe just bought the seal box pick. So there you go. Nice. Woo! Nice work, Joe. Yeah, Joe, you'll, you'll, you'll love it, man. It's really, oh, Brett Marquette says, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a very distinct. Uh, what's what's the pick on seal box that you have right now? Is it a Georgia Hardwood or is it a Duality? They they have a du they have a Duality. I, I don't know if they've sold out of it, and they okay. have a Georgia Hardwood. So the Georgia Hardwood um, is is the uh, the MGP finished on Georgia Oak, and yeah. the du Duality, like like all of our other products, is is made here by us. Um, but yeah, there's, I yeah, think so, two picks on Sealbox. So, so for those of you watching, if you're thinking about going on Sealbox and getting one of these, the Georgia Hardwood is more along the lines of a, of a traditional bourbon type of flavor profile with the wheat, got some nice fruit uh, notes to it, a little bit of spice as well, a lot of cinnamon. The duality is, you know, that's smoke, a little bit of chocolate. So you have those two types of flavor profiles. So whatever you want to try, those are kind of the distinctive flavor profiles. If you guys are... I would say, you know, if it was me, the Georgia Hardwood is really good. Uh, but I feel like if you want to try really what ASW is capable of, then try the duality. So, yeah. Uh, another product I feel like I need to mention, we have so many. Uh, Justin makes kick ass whiskey all the time, but uh, Tire Fire. So, people look at the orange label and they're like, oh, is that like a cinnamon whiskey or something? It is not. <laughs> It let, is let, a. Let me, uh, guess, let me guess. Tire fire. Is that a is that a traditional peated single malt? It is. It is. Ah, a heavy, yes, that's what I thought. Nailed it. it. Is a heavily peated single malt. So this is. I got. Uh, you got to send me some of that. I got to try. Oh, that. dude, I got you, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's it's in the mail. Uh, tire tire fire. Uh, it's this was a whiskey that actually uh, really what got me into because it's on New Oak. So it's one of those things that people that may not w want that that uh more soft floral 
things are coming from like a used bourbon cask. Um, you can get like the power of new oak and get the power of peat without it tasting like corny or anything. This is hundred percent malted barley. So, uh, that, so that's aged in pure new American oak. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent new white oak. And we get the barley sourced directly from Inver Inverness, Scotland. So this oh. is peated in Scotland and uh, heavily peated malt. It's fantastic. Uh, it's actually probably my favorite product we, we have here. I'm actually, I was drinking Optic Promise in my uh, glass, but I think I'm gonna move to some so, so, fire. So, so real quick, just for, so I mean, I'm kind of geeking out here. I know everybody that's watching. So when you source, you, you're saying you're sourcing barley, peated barley from Inverness, Scotland. So that comes to you. Now, are you guys milling and just like, how does it come to you? Yeah, so so we get it we get it um, milled there, and uh, or either either some of our uh, so we actually source some some barley from Ireland as well. Okay, that we get we get shipped uh, here, and then someone will mill it for us, and then we'll do it so we get it nice and fresh and milled. Oh, okay, uh, the tire fire actually need to. I'm not positive if it's milled in Scotland or milled in the United States. I would assume here in the United States, just for wanting to have that freshness, but I, I need to check, but it is peated in Scotland. So uh, it's which, peated in Scotland, some product and uh, essentially milled so either in Scotland or the United States before you guys get your hands on it to, uh, to ferment it and then make your, make your, uh, to make your single malt. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So we, yeah, we, we brew it. So we create the mash, we, we ferment it, we distill it. So it is a hundred percent, uh, you know, made. Is there, is there a, so how peated are we talking with tire fire? Are we talking like this? So Eric just said Georgia Octomore. <laughs> is it, it is it like that peated or is it a little bit softer? It's 45 ppm. So you'll, you'll put it right between Lafroig and Ardbeg on the ppm scale. So oh. Lafroig being at the at the you know the mid 30s and then Ardbeg being at the 55. So it's at 45 ppm's, um, but right. it, it it really hits that smoke too. So uh, it, it's uh, I think when we first released it, it was about. Uh, two years old uh, and now it's about two and a half to three years old but yeah, you really get all right so two and a half three years old matthew uh sounds like a uh -huh. well yeah that's it's an american single malt stevie ray yep it's not it's not a bourbon this is a peated american single malt that is correct yep and we have we have a we do have a cast strings version available that we are also are doing barrel picks for so i, I forgot to mention we are doing tire fire barrel picks which is actually something that uh you know when you think a lot of people think like, oh, you know, I'd love to have a, a, a single barrel scotch or something, but you're not seeing many scotch barrel picks in the United States. This is kind of like our answer to it. Like, hey, you can get this Scottish malt made in traditional pot stills in traditional uh, Scottish way, and we can do a single barrel picks of that. So uh, they've been doing pretty successful. Our single barrel actually won a gold medal um, this past year in San Francisco, while the, uh, standard it's 91 proof won a, a gold medal the previous year. So you're doing tire fire cast strength barrel picks too. Correct. Yeah. We're doing oh tire my fire. Yeah, dude, you're killing me. And then we have the, uh, the tire fire finished in a rum cask, which is what the fuck? Jesus. This, this, this is probably one, my favorite whiskey we've ever made. Oh uh, my God. That's is, incredible. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, super super uh, like. Fruity. Is that? It? Do, you, do you think? Do you think that's better than the Ardbeg Drum? So it's it's funny. My my buddies <laughs> and I we drink a lot of a lot of whiskey. Um, and I have grooves. I have black. Uh, he has scorch. I have. Um, we we pretty much have like every Ardbeg, but none of us have gone out and bought drum. So I've never. <laughs> never tried to, never tried drum, but I, I mean to. I, I do intend on going and picking up a bottle of drum soon. Well, dude, so. I mean, I have I, I have drum, so if you send me a couple of bottles of that, some of that stuff, I will send you all the drum you want. <laughs> all right, get, give me a little sample of that. Yeah, shout, shout out to my, my friends I drink uh, whiskey with uh, since I brought you up. Kevin. Yeah, wait, the peated finish and rum cask? Yes. So how yeah. – so how – um. how distinct is the rum finish in that? How How long are you keeping that in the rum cask? Very. It's about a year finished in a rum cask, and I, I a should year. Holy yeah. shit! I should mention that's a local rum distillery. So Richland Rum, uh, located in uh, South Georgia near Savannah. Okay. Uh, they uh, actually grow their own sugar cane and do a uh, traditional pot 
distillation and make badass uh, pot stilled rum. And so this, we were so like, this, this, yeah, this is like a four square style rum, no sugar added, all sugar, all pure sugar cane. Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. So that's, that's, the, ty that's like. the type of rum cast that we were we were wanting to use, and uh, Eric was willing to partner with us on that. So, I mean, Jesus, you guys are covering every single type of whiskey drinker in your lineup. You have you have traditional bourbon with the Georgia Heartwood. You have your something a little bit different with your Fiddler, a little bit of a chocolate, a high malt. You have a rye. You have single malts. You have finished single malts, finished ryes. I mean, Jesus. I had, yeah. no, I had no idea of the expansive lineup that you guys have. This is insane. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to mention this because this is Justin's favorite whiskey. So this is Justin's favorite whiskey that he makes. It's Druid Hill. It is a Irish style whiskey. So it's triple distilled uh, in traditional Irish way in pot stills. And we actually source uh it's it's partially malted and partially unmalted barley and we we source the malted barley directly from ireland um so this is justin's all-time favorite whiskey that he makes um and his goal was to make something that he can enjoy that's similar to green spot personally i can say this because i'm, I'm not the one that made this but i, pr I prefer this to green spot so much really? love to you justin so, so wait so what's in that exactly from a uh, grain wise it, it is 70% malted barley and 30% unmalted barley. So this is so this is like an American style Irish whiskey, basically. Yeah, this is about as close to Irish whiskey as you can get outside of Ireland. Jesus Lord. Donald Donald Ranch, you hear that in the chat? We have an American style Irish whiskey. He's his mind just exploded right now. Our Irish style American whiskey. Ir yeah, Irish style American. <laughs> there you go. Um, popping to watch them, bro. I'm going nuts right now. Where can we buy the rum cast finished peated whiskey? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we do have a few available here at the uh distillery. We're going to do so. We actually released a single barrel of it that was more of like a test, uh, it went very well. So we're we're currently uh finishing a lot more in rum casks, so we'll be releasing that soon. So, here's a good technical question What are the strength of the low wines, and are you recycling the faints? Yes. So that is a great question. Uh, so yeah, Ju Justin's uh, process um, with our low wines, we're getting uh, right around uh, six, 60 proof. So it's about 30% alcohol in our low wines, uh, which is a little bit, a little bit higher. Uh, some people will run, run a little bit lower and get, get down to uh, 20, 25%, um, but we, we usually do 30%, cut the run off a little early. Um, but the uh, spirit, the spirit run, uh, we keep both the uh, heads and the tails, um, getting rid of the four shots, obviously, like the methanol we get rid of, but the heads and the tails, we, we recycle those faints and mix them in with the low wines for our next distillation. And that really makes in a really, or really attributes a lot of the flavor that we get. We've even done experiments with, uh, with faints. Some people get a kick out of this. We've done a, a single malt mash bill that we use the tire fire faints with to make a lightly peated single malt whiskey. Um, oh, and okay. th so like yeah, a, so like a Highland style whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. We call it Burns night and we, uh, we got in a lawsuit with the Scotch malt whiskey association. Uh, <laughs> yeah, over, over that. Could, yeah. Burns <laughs> night is very, Burns night is, is it like a religious like day? I wouldn't <laughs> want to mess with that. We we actually I think I think we I don't I can't say for sure that we won but I think we're we're all right we we can keep the the name Burns night for now. <laughs> yeah, uh, Donald Rance. Wait, what? An Irish pot still? So are you? So you're making that that Irish style American whiskey in, in your pot stills, correct? Correct. Yeah. So every, yeah, we make everything except for the the Unison and the Heartwood from the Fiddler brand. So everything we make here is distilled here. Dude, I am freak I'm freaking out over that Irish. That's that Irish style American whiskey and your rum finished peated tire fire. That's that's insane. Yeah, I mean, yeah, got, that's crazy. I'm gonna get you some of the, some bottles of that for sure. Get you some samples, and then I gotta get you get you down here to come do a barrel pick. Yeah, I think that's next up. I mean, uh, I don't know how Scott from my bourbon journey is gonna feel about the tire fire because he does not like uh, <laughs> <laughs> he does not like single malt at all. But I I am all in on one of those. That's crazy. Got to um, get him on the duality first. That's the gateway. Yeah, sixty hertz says yes. I've done that myself. It's amazing how much peat you can get into an unpeated whiskey with peated faints. 
Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. The uh, the types of I see I, that's something I didn't even know. I didn't realize you can kind of do some experimentation with heads and tails, getting those fates involved in your next batch to really kind of you know create new flavor profiles. That's a whole nother type of. I mean, that's like kind of like distillation. That's like distillation 102. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, and you can really dive in with. Uh, so me being the assistant distiller, you know, I, I can run the stills and I know uh, what's going on and I can make the whiskey. But some of his ways of crafting, talking to Justin will really uh, help you understand like his thought process and like, yeah. let's let's do this and let's use these faints for this and try to get these flavors. So, yeah, it's totally Totally. I, you know, as, as I, I gotta say, I, um, I was, I was really interested in ASW after I tasted this, but after you kind of ran through the lineup and what you guys have crafted you and Justin and the team there, um, I am super impressed of what you guys have. I think it's really different. You have something pretty much for every type of whiskey drinker, uh, you know, on earth, whether it be an Irish style, a Scottish style, a single malt, a peated, rum finished rye bourbon high malt i mean jesus i mean you guys are um uh it, it's very impressive so i, I really want to thank you for coming on and taking us through not only your entire lineup but taking us into the distillery show you those show those two magical copper pot stills um if any of you guys are in atlanta please go check out asw i think you have uh an amazing um uh, just line up. Of, I mean, you could pretty much try anything to see if you're interested, what type of whiskey drinker you are, basically. Um, but not only that, I mean, I think you guys and you guys are just crafting really, you know, just tremendous whiskeys. And um, yeah, I just, you know, hats off to you guys. Thanks. Uh, let us let everybody know here where they could find you, where in Atlanta you guys are and uh, where we can, uh, wherever we could find you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, big shout out to uh, Sprayberry Bottle Shop. They do a lot of picks with us and they pick some real badass whiskey. Um, big shout out to uh, just just all the local guys. Uh, Tower Beverage is a good local spot, local vine. Um, I mean, pretty much any liquor store you go into in Georgia, they, they should have uh, most of our products. Um, but yeah, Sealbox carries a lot of our products. I do believe they do carry the, the tire fire they, I think they carry Druid Hill as well, the Irish style whiskey. So most of our products you can get on Sealbox as well. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, guys, yeah. Keep, an eye, keep an eye on Sealbox for their stuff. Um, whiskey Nose and Eric Thompson saying go Yankees. Uh, any mod that's in the chat can actually boot them out a little bit early if you would like. <laughs> Just awesome. Yeah, awesome stream, by the way. Uh, blue, a lot of our minds. Exciting to uh, try some time. Um, uh, the Tire Fire cast rank is on Sealbox as well. Holy shit. It is, yes. I forgot to mention that. Tire Fire cast strength is available on Sealbox. Yeah, there's there's so much, man. So At so many places, I don't want to say the wrong thing, where something is or where something is it isn't. But, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, wait, where they, where they, where uh, where can people follow you on Instagram just to see what's coming up new at ASW? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely follow the uh, the main page, ASW Distillery. Uh, if you want to see what I'm up to, I have uh, my personal page where I post my family and uh, videos of me skateboarding. Uh, that's my hobby. <laughs> it's uh, just my name, Wit Hageman uh, at Wit Hageman, and then my whiskey page is Wit Ski. So W H I T. S K E Y Wit Ski. <laughs> awesome. It's, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I want to really thank you guys for coming in. Uh, remember, guys, uh, June 20th, Alzheimer's uh, fundraiser over at Whiskey Mountains. Next week, the director, Greg Schwartz from The Water of Life. You guys get to watch the movie before anyone else does right here on the Mass and Drum. You want really want to learn about. Uh, some of the great stuff that's going on in Isla. You got to check out that stream. Gonna be, it's going to be an amazing, amazing night next Wednesday night. Uh, I do want to uh, thank again for Wit. Thanks for everyone for hanging out tonight. And as I always say, it's not about the whiskey. It's the people you share with. So uh, cheers, Wit. Yeah. Hang out for a little bit. Don't shine off just yet. And uh, cool. I'll see you guys next time right here on the Mass and Drum. Take care, everybody. Yeah, big shout out.